Hi, everyone. This is Joy Pettit, and who do I have the pleasure of interviewing today? My name is Donna Mack. I am the disability diplomat. I have been involved in disability advocacy, advocating for and educating about the abilities uh, of people with disabilities for, gosh, uh, over 25 years. Because you started when you were three. That's it. Yes. So full disclosure, as I have said in many of these other interviews, I am privileged enough to call Donna a friend. And we may or may not have a cameo of Wella, who is evidently snoring nearby. Absolutely. So, thank you, Wella, the service dog slash other friend. And Donna, thanks for being with us today. Oh, hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So how I like to start these off is I want to ask two big concept questions where there's no wrong answer. And these are rolling around my brain, and I'm curious to see how they land on you. So first one is the concept of diversity dividend. So thinking about investment, action, return, bottom line, that kind of stuff. What does diversity dividend mean for you? Wow. Um, okay, people with disabilities make up the largest, most underrepresented minority group in the country. Sure. And the way that I put it to my audience is to my audiences is that um, you can join us at any time and you don't even need to wait around for an invitation. Mm -hmm. um, not to worry, we're very welcoming. And eventually you will all join us if you don't die first. So at some point in everybody's life, they're either going to acquire disability or die. And we've got an aging population. So to me, why not, as a business owner, why not make your businesses more accessible to employees with disabilities, to workers with disabilities? It's going to cut down on your training expenses. It's going to bring more revenue to you. People with disabilities, we will talk amongst ourselves. And if a business is maybe accessible to me, but it's not to me as someone with a visual impairment, but it's not accessible to my friend who's a wheelchair user. Quite often, I just, you know, I won't patronize that business. I will just go somewhere else. Yeah. Um, I also think it's interesting, um, at least in the industry meetings that I've been in, is that people actually think about accommodating wheelchair users, but they don't necessarily think about hearing accommodations, sight accommodations, language accommodations, scent sensitivity, allergies. Right. Uh, people are really good at food and in his wheelchairs that they're not so good at. Um, and let's be honest, they're not even that great with food. Um, but then there's all these other ones that don't even get thought about that do ultimately save training funds, retain um, talent as well as customers. So right. great. The other concept question is asterisk other duties assigned. So usually it's at the end of a job description or it's kind of how an employee may describe how they use some of their time or resources that may or may not actually be financially rewarded. What does asterisk other duties assigned mean to you? Mm, I, I, to me, if a company is on board for really being disability friendly or diversity friendly, then, then that person's strengths. And okay, here's what I think. I think that we need to look at employees' strengths regardless of disability status, okay? Um, that those that people's strengths need to be taken into account uh, when you decide to assign those other duties. Um, because we're all more productive when we can play to our strengths. Yeah, absolutely. When uh, this has been a theme that's been coming up, but if diversity is the collecting of different people, valuing them equally is the equity part. And then actually recognizing that their skills and ideas and contributions not just need to be included, but are actually a differentiator that are going to make your company or organization even better. Absolutely. Um, not based on their identities, but based on their ideas and skills, that's inclusion. So Correct. Awesome. Now, for you, Donna, one of the things that, I mean, there's a million things I love about you, starting first with your wicked, quick, and sharp sense of... 
sarcasm and humor. And what I love about your approach and what I think differentiates you from some of the other folks that I've interviewed that have visible disabilities is you come to those conversations as better serving customers with disabilities and less about you or your story. Can you talk about making that choice and how that shows up in your work with your customers? Well, I mean, and, and I don't mind sharing my story when, when that's appropriate, but I just, I look at the marketplace and I just see how this is a growing need because it's a growing population. I mean, my God, I'm a consumer. Mm -hmm. And as a consumer, I look at what is my consumer experience like with the business from the first point of contact, contact which is normally going to be looking them up on the web and hey if their site's not accessible um you know that's a big deal to me and and it has occurred to me you know over the years there have been times when i have you know maybe brought up an accessibility issue with a business and at that point so many of them it's the first time they've thought about it Disability is kind of like divorce and cancer. It always happens to somebody else until it happens to you or somebody you love. Mm -hmm. You're right. And, you know, it, I don't think it's that business or businesses are meaning to exclude us. It just doesn't touch their life. So they don't think about it. And, and I guess, you know, I've kind of looked at, well, what do I have that's unique to bring to the marketplace? And I've served on some committees. I served on the accessibility committee for uh, AT&T Stadium in Dallas-Fort Worth, which is where the Dallas Cowboys play. And I'm now serving on uh, the same committee for the new ballpark for the Texas Rangers that will be opening next year. And so I'm just looking at that going, well, I, I think I'm good at expressing customer experience. And sometimes it's an amazing customer experience but sometimes it's not, and it's not even intentional that it's not. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the, the beauty, right, is that there's intentional harm, and then there's the expense of the unintentional harm, both of which need to be addressed. Well, and, and you know, the other part of this that I just was thinking about, too, is that um, we don't want to be viewed, people with disabilities, we don't want to be viewed as taking from the system. We want to be viewed as just like everybody else. My God, we're taxpayers. We're parents. We're, you know, spouses, partners, friends, employees. Um, you know, we want to be viewed like everyone else. And to me, mm -hmm. reminding businesses that, hey, you know, we're your bread and butter. Um, because if right now 20% of us have a disability, I mean, that's 20% of somebody's, you know, customer base that they might be willing to overlook. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of dollars left on the table. So. Yeah. Well, I think it's really, really valuable. And I'm really glad you're able to join us and talk about some of these issues that people don't necessarily think about until to use your language, it actually touches their own life. Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah, don't wait until that happens. Like, get ahead of it. So Yeah, absolutely, because it's a whole lot less expensive to plan for it than it is to retrofit it. Right, absolutely. All right, are you ready for my two favorite questions? Oh, I hope so. All right, first one is, what have you changed your mind about lately? Oh, my gosh, what I have changed my mind about lately is what I think I know. I feel like... I used to have some really, I mean, and there are still things I have definite opinions on and my God, I'm so opinionated. Yeah, I'll share them with you. But, but there are just a lot of things that I know, I know certain things to be truth for me and because it, it's truth for me, or it may even be truth for me today. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to be truth for you. And that's okay. I, I don't know. I think I've just gotten to be a lot more live and let live the older I get. <laughs> Age helps. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it's an interesting segue to my second favorite question, and that is, what do you absolutely know? <laughs> yeah, I love it. <laughs> I, I, I know that there's a lot I don't know. <laughs> and, and, 
And I guess, you know what, one thing I absolutely do know that I've really felt very strongly about lately is that I know that in more cases than not, it's a more positive, constructive thing. It's more helpful to assume good intent than malintent. Mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes in our society, we get, we become so, we've just become so polarized. It's such an us and them world. And yeah, I think we need to look at our uniquenesses and everything, but my God, there's still a lot of common thread that runs through everybody. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd really just love to see people give other people the benefit of the doubt a little more. It's, it's interesting when thinking about the concepts of polarization and that I think that we've created a way for us to constantly be reminded of our own echo chamber. Yeah. Yeah. We're like constantly renewing who us is um, by Facebook or our friends or who we're mm -hmm. texting or what email we did or what books we're reading, what music we listen to. We're constantly reaffirming the us so that we have a clearer definition of who isn't us, who therefore must be them. Well, and you know what? And also what that does for me is it's like, oh my God, I talk about diversity, but now I've gotten kind of paranoid thinking, well, what if I use a politically correct term with somebody who's, you know, kind of represents another aspect of diversity. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I don't even mean harm. Does that make any sense? It's almost like we have hyper heightened our awareness and I think it needs to be heightened, but sometimes I think we just, like I said, need to just assume positive intent because sometimes we all have our back up a little bit and yeah, there are times it needs to be, but, but we got to build some bridges. Yeah. I think that it's a really beautiful point before we get into the lightning round, right? Is that I think we both identify as white women and there's a possibility that I will be nervous about talking about disability, sight, blindness, uh, sight accommodations, even um, when we were signing up or getting logged into this Zoom platform to do this interview, I was like, oh, how do I give you directions on how to get your video started? Because I normally just tell people to click on the button in the bottom left corner. Like I can get nervous because I know that this isn't something I feel proficient at even though I live in the jeopardy column of diversity and inclusion, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a possibility that you may have, I don't know what it could be, but you may have an area too where you get all like, oh, what's the right vocabulary word here? And I think yeah. that, that's a really important piece. And well, sometimes I forget to, you know, so someone the space or grace. Absolutely. You know, because there, there are sometimes like with the whole pronoun thing, mm -hmm. And okay, and you know, this is an age thing with me. I mean, I don't always think maybe if I'm in a certain, if I'm speaking to a certain group, I would tend to ask what pronoun somebody would prefer. Mm -hmm. Or if I'm speaking to, you know, like I said, a certain population, but generally that's not something I think to ask. And it's not that I don't mean to be inclusive. Right. And we navigate the world where people magically just use pronouns that we align with. Right. So when someone asks us what our pronoun preference is, it's like a grammar pop quiz, right? Exactly, exactly. Right. What's a pronoun again? What are my options? Oh wait, I know how to answer this question. <laughs> so, uh, but it's a really important piece. And I think that it takes a lot of realness, if not maybe a dash of vulnerability to acknowledge that diversity inclusion work is complex. And just because you enter through one door does not mean you have mastered them all. Um, Correct. I appreciate you saying that. So, well, thank you. Yeah. All right. Are you ready for lightning round? Yeah. <laughs> Drum roll. Okay. So you randomly gave me three numbers at the beginning. And as my icebreaker cards, they are a number 50 something questions that are either easy, intermediate, or advanced. So I'm going to ask you the questions that you randomly chose, and then you have to answer them quickly um, oh without thinking about them too much. Are you ready? Uh, I hope so. Okay. Number 20 is intermediate. Who has been one of the most influential people in your life and why? My dad. Just because he was one of those people that with my disability, 
he was not always the most comfortable person to know the most, it may be the smoothest way to guide me somewhere. There were times that I knew he felt a little awkward, but my God, he had the best heart. He would, you know, he would drive me anywhere I needed to go if I asked him and he had free time on his schedule. And it's just a thing of, you know, sometimes it doesn't matter if you approach something awkwardly, it's your heart that counts. Yeah. Which again is that space and grace thing. Yeah. All right. Number 14. Easy question. What was your first pet or first pet you knew? Name, type, breed, personality, traits, etc. My first pet was a chihuahua. She was black. Her name was Ladybug. And she was my childhood dog. And she didn't shake. So I'm kind of wondering if she was if you know if she was full blood chihuahua or or not but um gosh you know when it's your dog of childhood it's like personality i mean she liked to snuggle and she for some reason thought it was really cool to bark at volkswagens <laughs> when she saw him i don't know if she well, thought they were a big dog out. or what <laughs> that's funny volkswagens are tricky beasts um <laughs> Number 19, intermediate also, is what is your favorite quote or inspirational message that you try to live by? Um, okay. It, I mean, it, it's not to get preachy, but it happens to be, it's a biblical quote. You are and, allowed to do anything you want to. It's what you live by. And, and it is. For momentary light affliction is working within us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison while we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things that are unseen mm -hmm. because the things that are seen are temporary and the things that are not seen are eternal. And, you know, so anytime I'm going through some stuff, <laughs> I, you know, I just try to remember it's, it's temporary. I'm going to get to the other side and you know, what it's building in me in character and resilience and compassion for other people, it, it's, you know, it's, it's going to be good. I mean, and, and I, I went through a divorce a couple of years back and, and, uh, and I found that to be true, you know, so it, it, it can, it can be applied to a lot of things in life. Well, that's beautiful. Life is good. Donna, Donna thank you so much for spending time with us. If, People want to get in touch with you. And by if, I mean, y'all get in touch with Donna. How <laughs> should people do that? Um, they can visit my site, which is disabilitydiplomat.com. They can email me at Donna at disabilitydiplomat.com. I, I know you're going to have some links up for uh, other social media. Um, my Facebook page is... I mean, you can just do a search for, I think it's Donna Mac, MED, Disability Diplomat. So, and look, you know, look for me on LinkedIn. So, that's great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for oh, all. Thanks, Jess.